the 91st pick in the 2023 NFL Draft, the Buffalo Bills select Dorian Williams, linebacker Tulane. Let's go! Welcome into our instant draft reaction presented by Ticketmaster. I'm Maddie Glab and I'm joined by Bills insider Chris Brown. And with their third pick in the draft, the Bills select a linebacker out of Tulane. It's Dorian Williams. He's 6'1, 228. This is an athletic linebacker. He ran a 4'4, 940. So he's got some speed to him. He's fluid on the field. He's good in open space and a team captain. So, Chris, how does this fill a need? How, how does this fill a void? We know tremendously. Maine Edmonds left to go to the Chicago Bears in free agency. Brandon Bean has said, you know, the guys who are part of the linebacker group right now on the roster, they deserve a shot at at the starting spot. But we see the Bills go linebacker here. Yeah, I'm going to be very interested to see what Brandon Bean has to say about Dorian Williams in terms of where he sees him lining up. He played weak side linebacker for mm -hmm. Tulane. This is a sideline to sideline athlete. Guys all over the field had a monster senior season with 131 tackles in just 14 games. So you can do the math and you can see how productive he was. He was the defensive MVP in the Cotton Bowl. He had 17 tackles against USC. He was giving Caleb Williams fits when he was out there scrambling around. So it's, it's an athlete. It makes the defense faster, but he plays Matt Milano's position. Now, I think the good thing is the base defense for Tulane – is a 4 2 5 yeah. nickel defense. So, hopefully, coming to Buffalo, where they play a lot of that as well, that will help with his transition. But I really want to hear what Brandon Bean has to say as far as where they see him fitting, because at only 228 pounds, I don't know if middle linebacker is an option here with him. He really helped flip a Tulane team that was 2-10 in 2021 to 12-2 in 2022. So he's a guy who's had a lot of experience in terms of the games that he's played in. He's played in 49 games, over 300 tackles, 27 tackles for loss, 9.5 sacks, 15 passes defense. So he put up numbers when he was at Tulane. The question mark here is where do you see him fitting in with the Bills? As yeah. Chris said, he's he's a will linebacker. He's a weak side linebacker. The nice thing is he did play in a 4-2-5. That means he's similar with the base defense that the Bills usually play in. They always play in nickel or they have in the last few seasons. We'll see if anything really changes with Sean McDermott calling the plays here. But from what you've seen from him, from what the analysts have said, Chris, what are what's the upside in a player like this? Uh, this is a kid who's not going to let a running back get to the corner. Um, he's a guy that strings out run plays that go wide because he can cover so much ground. He is a read and react player. He's not really blessed with tremendous football instincts. He relies on his athleticism to do that. So I think this is a guy who brings athleticism, mm -hmm. not only on the defensive side of the ball, but could be a real help on special teams as a rookie. I, I see him on those coverage team units getting down the field and making plays there too. And that's a need for this team. I mean, any time you can add to that special teams unit, this coaching staff prides themselves off of having a really great special teams and really caring about that third phase of the game. Bill's general manager, Brandon Bean, is on the podium right now to break down Dorian Williams and Osiris Torrance, so we'll send it over to Brandon. Two picks, both offense. What would you say was the focus on offense for those first two picks as opposed to those happen to be the players on your board? Meaning, could you have just as easily gone defense, yeah. or was this the philosophy? No, it was, uh, it was following the board. Um, Tonight, um, you know, Osiris was, uh, he was the highest guy on the board. And that's why we, it was, it was an e those are the easy ones. And it was getting, you know, when we were coming to the next pick on defense, <clears throat> it could have gone, it was getting close to where it could have been offense too, but offense was taken, you know, a certain number of picks before, I don't remember. But um, same thing, by the time he was on the clock, he was, he was the highest guy on the board. By how much? He, Enough. Yeah. <laughs> the reason I ask is because a lot of people thought he was he looked like he had some first round juice. You talking about uh, Osiris? Osiris yeah, 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 yeah. He was clearly. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was talking about Dorian on the second one, but o Osiris, uh, he was clearly on. He was he was alone. With, with you are talking about Brandon, how that 
you look what you've done in free agency at the guard position, and now you add him. Maybe that, I would think that accentuates the, an obvious priority. Yeah, I mean, um, you can never go wrong adding up front. And this was a guy we, we spent a lot of time around and, and um, brought him in as well. And just, um, you know, I, I know the Coach Napier down at Florida spent some time with him. And, and I went down to practice visiting with him. And he, he just raved about the young man. He was excited to bring him over from, from Louisiana with him as a guy to, you know, this is a guy that this is the culture I want to bring here to Florida. And... Um, Cool thing about him, they didn't just put him in as the starter. Um, they started him on the third team and made him earn his way. And by the time they were ready to start playing games, he had he had earned a starting uh, you know spot at Florida. What role do you see, or, or how do you see Dorian fitting in? You know, got four guys in the linebacker room that, that are all basically the same size. Well, he'll just he'll just add to the mix. Um, He's he's another guy. I don't know. Like when you say the same size, what do you mean? Well, I mean, is he, you, do you feel middle outside? Um, you know, we'll st we'll start him outside, and and we'll see. We you know we try to make these guys somewhat interchangeable. Uh, so, you know, he's this is going to be a much more complex system. So we'll we'll gradually again. Some of these guys come from a more complex system. I would say this is a simpler system that he's coming from. Just what we know about him, the time we've spent with him. So it's mentally, it will take him from a football foundation a little bit more in our defense. It's, it's not a, you know, it's not as complex as what he's going to have here. So we'll start him at a spot, um, but not going to say he could never be a dual guy. I wouldn't think year one, you know, we would do much of a, you know, duel with him, but we'll get him in here. He's a tackling machine. He's, he's very athletic. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say he's going to come in here and start, but at a minimum, I see this guy earning a jersey. He's, Matt Smiley's going to be excited um, to add him to the group to get a jersey. And then, you know, we'll, we'll see, if, you know, what kind of play time, you know, he earns this year. And, but that could, it could also be a, a guy that's a, you know, a backup for us this year if he doesn't earn a starting role and, you know, potentially down the role, at, you, know, at, at, you know, at a starting role. Just played a lot of football. Just kind of, what do you like best about him, and how do you see his uh, his development so far from a technique standpoint? Yeah, I mean, he's a big man, Mark. Um, you know, it's uh, size size matters up in there when you're you're facing some of those guys, and you know, you're, we got some really good D tackles in this division, and so having a guy who can anchor versus power, you know, that's probably what he does best, and he, you know, he's got length, you know, to you know, get on guys and hold them off. You know, I'm, you're not going to see people running down his cylinder. I thought you saw, you know, sometimes you go from a lower level to SEC, which is, as we know, probably the highest level, you know, in college football, and it wasn't too big for him. And so I, I expect that same transition here. It's not going to be easy. He'll have to come in here and earn the role. We're not going to give him anything. But, uh, you know, size, strength, power, those would be, you know, his top attributes. How do you see Osiris playing on left or right? Well, he'll just compete. You know, we, you know us. We'll, we'll put him in there, and and we'll all these guys will come in. We, you know, we're not moving him in and saying you're starting day one. He's got to come in here, and we'll try him all around and, and get the best five. You know, once it's time for games. Brandon, what impressed you about Osiris's decision to leave? You know, Louisiana Lafayette. And, and, and test himself at the SEC level. And I guess just the confidence that he had in knowing that he could do that. What does that tell you about his character? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the story that I like was he didn't, you know, he knew the head coach and he didn't go in there and say, I, I, yeah, I'll transfer if you give me the starting job. And he just came in there and, you know, he worked. And this is exactly what Coach Napier said. He just, you know, put his head down, worked, started with the threes, moved up to the twos. And eventually, you know, earn that starting role, and that's what you want—a guy that's not afraid of competition. He's going to earn everything, and and it'll be the same adjustment here, you know, as he moves to the NFL. Yeah, um, you know, we enjoyed you know most all of our visits, but. Some of them stand out, and I would say just it felt natural for him and for us. I know that you know I always follow up with the people that you know deal with him besides me, and and I know the coaches really enjoyed him and thought 
He's going to come in here. This is how we would use him. This is what we would do. These are the type of run game things we would do with him. This is how he'll anchor and pass. We, you know, it just it meshed well. You know, he really, you know, I know when we called him tonight, he, you know, he he was excited to, you know, Buffalo sounds like was one of the places he was hoping to get selected. So you always like that when they're excited that, uh, you know, that just chose him. You mentioned that he could play tackle, but would you see him with any flexibility, Osiris? I think we'll start him at guard. Um, you know, if if he proves and, and wants to do that, that he can go out there. But I, right now, I would see his best chance. You know, to help us would probably be inside. Brandon talking about Cyrus at the combine. One of the things that he mentioned was blocking for a mobile quarterback in Anthony Richardson. At Florida, and now he thought that was going to help him translate to the NFL. Is that something? That part of the equation when you look at a guy like that and Josh Allen obviously being mobile. Yeah, I mean, we definitely looked at him in that offense. Um, we went back and watched him at Louisiana also, and and um, it's a it's a plus. He's been around it. He knows that you know the ball's not necessarily coming out as soon as they're the quarterback's back foot, you know, it hits his back step. That you know you got to stay on your guys. You got to keep blocking, and and obviously they did that at Florida. And, and we know Josh, you know, loves to extend plays, and and so the same thing will definitely be asked here. Dalton and Osiris are both already 23 years old. Drafting older guys, is that a philosophy? No. Previous years you've drafted younger guys in the first round, especially. Is it COVID an impact of that at all? Like, is there any concern? It's just a coincidence. It really is. We're just trying to get good players. You love it. Yeah, if if they're 21 and you go, man, this guy's got great upside and they haven't hit a ceiling. But uh, I think this guy, he's played one year of major college football. I think there's more with him. and, And I think you know we can we can get his you know his body weight you know even even better with you know adding more muscle mass um, to make him more athletic and more powerful. Brandon, looking, looking at <coughs> to tomorrow, as as things stand right now, you guys only have two more picks. If you were to you know maybe try to make a move to maybe get some more draft capital, is that something that you guys look at like tonight or like first thing tomorrow morning? Like when do those conversations possibly start about? maybe trying to find a partner to make a move to get more picks. Yeah, I mean, and we had opportunities tonight with both picks, but it just, you know, where we were going to have to go to. With the first one with Osiris, we didn't even consider it. This one, as it was getting close, you know, we had, you know, several teams that were interested in the pick, but um, all of them were going to have to drop too far, and, and we just felt, you know, our board could get cleaned out to where we'd be picking too low for you know, for giving up a player of Dorian's, you know, caliber. But as as far as tomorrow, you know, we don't have to, you know, we don't have a fourth. I would have loved to have gotten one, but at the same time, I I don't want to give up a good player just to say, oh, well, we added a pick. So we'll we'll have to be patient in the fourth, and then, you know, we'll see. We're early five, so um, you know, we'll just we'll see where that goes. If there's a player there we really feels the value, we'll we'll do it. If not, we'll see if we can add something later in the fifth, sixth, you know, or even the seventh. As far as, um, I know you said you're following the board, but you could, I I mean, in terms of maneuvering or whatever could have been done, um, from a defensive standpoint, did you go into this draft feeling, hey, look, if, if, if the board takes us to offense the way it did, you know, other than just shrugging and say that's how it was, is there a part of you that says this defense, even with some struggles and so forth, can find its way with what you have. Like, is there a, is that a thought, a philosophy on your part, on the collective part of the team? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely, Vic, you know, I get your question. We're definitely looking. We got guys on defense that were like, hey, if they're there at the right value, I think, you know, with the first two picks, it was just, it was clearly the offensive guy, um, you know, was clearly the best player. And so you, you really didn't even look there. This time the defensive player was, and and I think we'll see. But you know we feel very good. We you know we did have some injuries in, in various spots, and you know we feel some guys, you know, will play even better this year. Another year in the system, another year in the NFL, just continuing to mature. Especially some of the guys up front where we where we drafted some you know some younger players, and they know we're counting on more consistency and more from them. And so we're excited about that. But um, you know we do have a couple more picks and and. If there's a defensive guy that we think makes sense to add to the, you know, add to the group, we we wouldn't hesitate to do it. How much are you really like making a point of emphasis on making this again one of the most competitive rosters that you have put together? 
Yeah, I mean, that's the key. You, we're trying to find competition. You'd love to just sit there and say I'm drafting starters, but that's that's not realistic, especially in certain spots where you've got, you know, you know, we just drafted a linebacker and we got Matt Milano who's one of the, the best in the game. So um, you're not necessarily saying he's going to plug in and start outside backer, but um, you just draft good football players. You know, things happen, injuries happen. You never know. It's hard to predict. Um, like I said, I know in Carolina one year, we had just paid a center uh, in, in a guy named Justin Hartwig, and we had Ryan Khalil, you know, high in the in the second round or bottom of first, somewhere up there, and he was sticking out. And you're trying to find somewhere else. We just paid this center, but ultimately take a good football player, and he was good enough that we moved on from the guy we paid, and he became an all pro. So um, I, that story's always stuck with me, and, and there's been other ones, but that one was a clear one of take good football players, don't worry about who's starting right now. Injuries, other things happen, contracts get in the way, and it'll all kind of settle itself. You spent a lot of time with Osiris. You mentioned going down and talking about him, you know, with his coaches and all that. It's the senior bowl. Senior bowl. How much did it help having a year of games, like getting to know you with Aaron Cromer, to then go into this scouting cycle and say, okay, this is what we're with, did it, and then this is what we're specifically looking for? Yeah, that's a good question, Matt. I think um, – Last year, we were definitely getting to know Chrome and what, what he was looking for. It was Dorsey's first year. What tweaks did he want to make from an offensive uh, system, you know, whether it's pass protection, run game stuff, whether you're doing outside go zone, mid zone, gap scheme. What, you know, how do you want to you know, kind of mix your offense up? Definitely a good feel. And Chrome understanding how we see players too. So I felt even going back to free agency with McGovern, that was one where – scouting and coaching were in sync with what we need. Last year, we were definitely trying to figure that out. And, and so Osiris was a guy, like I was telling Catherine earlier, that uh, we felt was you know, a good mix you know, throughout, and especially when he came on his 30 visit. It was just like, man, this guy could really fit here in Buffalo. Right. Uh, well, to, to go back to the big question, and I, I know how the board fell the way it fell for you when you wound up getting a tight end and, and uh, a guy who who's big and can protect Josh. Um, was there, is there some, maybe relief is not the right word, but is there some aspect that you're pleased with adding those two pieces on offense because perhaps to shake up an offense that seems to get stale as the year progressed? Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, we were definitely hoping to add some more pieces this off season. I mean, uh, I'm excited about, you know, some of the guys we added earlier, Hardy and Sherfield. Um, some some different pieces, and again, just looking for weapons. Whether it's speed, whether it's you know Kincaid, we feel could be a, a mismatch type. What you know, whether you want to call him a tight end, which he is a tight end, but he'll be as I said last night, flexed out and trying to get him on the right matchup. Um, you know, inside down the seam, all you know, all those things. So um, just trying to add more pieces, more competition, and I think you know, again up front, we brought in McGovern, David Edwards. Um, Ike Buckers back fully last year. He obviously was the Achilles thing. So I feel like we've got some really good competition. And, you know, it'll be fun when we get to training camp. Hopefully all these guys are healthy to, you know, let them battle it out and see who's the best five. Well, Cyrus didn't allow a sack his entire college career. How often do you see that from a player who faced, I think, over 1,500 pass rush snaps? Yeah, that's, that's remarkable um, just from a focus standpoint, you know. We'll, we'll watch really good players that you see get drafted at the top, but sometimes they just they get bored or they lose focus. Like nobody can can beat you. So, um, you know, I'm not sure there's there's very many people that have that on their resume. So that that speaks to his desire to be great every single play, no matter whether you're playing, you know, Alabama or you're playing, you know, the Sisters of the Poor. I know. With, with. <laughs> with, with a tough team. Also. <laughs> I'll get that off. I'll get that to you offline. <laughs> with with Torrance and McGovern, um, you, you draft him, you sign, you sign um, McGovern. With Bates, I know, like over the course of his time with you guys, you have had him at all five spots. Yeah. Is maybe some time a tackle at some point out of the realm of possibility for him, or do you see him solely interior? Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost there, but we know, you know, we've always said Bates could go get us out of a game at tackle. 
Um, I think we'll still rotate him, you know, at the at the guards and and then backing up Mitch at center. But um, I have no doubt that he could go out there and, and get us out of a game and tackle. I don't know if we would, you know, have him doing a lot of that, but you know, maybe enough just to make sure he's ready. You know, from a, a game day relief standpoint, if you know, if injury struck. Ryan, did any particular positions stick out where there's still value heading into day three, whether or not offense or defense? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, there was a little bit of run on receivers, but there's always so many receivers. I think there, you know, some of those guys, you know, again, we're going to have to wait a while to, you know, at least it's early five, but we're going to have to, you know, get through that fourth round. So, um, you know, we'll see. That's probably the position that I remember had the most, maybe some maybe some corners that were starting to be a little bit of run there, but um, I feel like, we, you know, we still had, you know, some DBs on the board. Experience of not having that fourth round pick makes you a little bit at ease now going into the meeting the tail line. Uh, it kills me. I hate not having a pick, um, but again, I slept better knowing that we, you know, we were able to get Kincaid last night. So in the end, it was worth it. Pertaining to Elena's question about the players being a little bit older and having COVID and extra years and all these kids are coming out a little bit. Yeah, these young men are coming out a little bit older, potentially. How much do you weigh that in the factoring of arc? Or you see more tape on them, you get a little more tape that they stick around longer, but they're a year older. How do you reconcile that? Yeah, I mean, I think we still consider um, what is their ceiling? And we talk about that. Is this, we talk about where's where's their floor, where's their ceiling? Some guys, you know, they they're truly have a low floor, but a high ceiling. Um, you know, and do they have the intangibles to achieve it? You know, some guys, even though they're 23, they've been playing at a small program. We feel we get them in here. We can still do stuff with them. But there's others that even at major programs that we go, this guy's tapped out. He's 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 a good player, but what you're seeing now at whatever SEC or ACC, whatever school, you know, he's at, um, that's probably who you're going to see here. So um, age does matter for sure, but... Um, it's not the you know end all be all. Are there without any secrets? Are there traits that lend itself to that where you look at a couple of very specific traits? I'm sure it's position to position, but where you say there's room here beyond like a size or putting up power. I mean, are there things that you look at and say? Yeah, you you look at you know what's what's their explosiveness, and and you look at like guys being able to bend and and things that the program they've been in, you know, all those things. We look at some of the things that they get tested for at the combine, some of those guys that go and, and you know, we we do certain tests with them, the guys that come in for the 30 visits. And, you know, we talk with our staff on, that's one of the things before the draft of, you know, hey, I don't know that I, we can do a lot with, with this person. And some of it's injury related. Like, you know, you're not, this guy's got a degenerative knee and it's just, it's always gonna kind of hold him back. Yes, he's a great athlete, but, this is going to be a little bit of an issue. You ever, you ever have a day with a Saturday with only two picks? I don't know. I wish you guys would find me another one uh, before I get here tomorrow. But no, I don't know. I'm a, like I said, um, it was hard. What's that? What do you do with that free time? I uh, just you know sit there and uh, get annoyed when guys I like come off the board. <laughs> but uh, no, nah, we'll just we'll stay ready and uh, you know. Again, hopefully there's a really good player at five. If not, that we're that we're like. If not, then I'll definitely try and move back. Does it change how you have to evaluate or scout with the transfer portal? Like guys, I mean, you have, now you have a couple of guys you drafted that started at one school, went to another school, it was different competition, one year at the SEC. How, how does that work? For you? Yeah, I think you ju- you look at everything. You you definitely uh, how was the transition? Um, what kind of system are they playing in? Um, are they walking into, you know, is it going to be a major curve here? You know, you, you always ask, why did they transfer? Were they running from competition um, or, you know, just better opportunity? Their coach left. You know, you always try to find out and make sure it's not something that you think, huh, if this guy gets here and doesn't win the starting job, he's going to be asking for a trade or, you know, whatever. But um, every situation is kind of its own, especially nowadays, because it's so easy to transfer for pretty much anything. Awesome. Thank you.
All right, that was Bills general manager Brandon Bean and a lot to unpack there as he was breaking down Osiris Torrance and Dorian Williams, why they fit, why he liked them. And, and let's just start with Dorian Williams first since he was the yeah. most recent draft pick to the Bills. Um, and just an overall comment that Brandon Bean said that I thought was pretty interesting. He said, we want to pick good players. When good players are available, we're going to go after them regardless of mm -hmm. maybe exact fit within the defense or the offense or the position group, knowing that during his time with the Panthers, they had some people that were already on the team, but they didn't want to pass up a good player when it was available. Right, and and like, that's kind of his draft philosophy here yeah. with the Bills, saying Doreen Williams is, is a will linebacker. They already have Matt Milano on this team. Matt Milano is going to be your starting outside linebacker, but don't pass up on a guy like Dorian Williams when he is sticking out on that draft board. Yeah, I'm not going to worry about who's starting now. I'm going to worry about who's the best player that I can get for the team, and we'll figure out where he fits next. And if he doesn't start in year one, so be it. you got a Pro Bowl caliber weak side linebacker. The odds are that Dorian Williams is not going to start <laughs> on defense this year because you got Matt Milano. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I'm tweeting out Brandon Bean talking about how Dorian Williams is going to contribute on special teams as yeah. a rookie where he can do where he can help that unit a lot. And people are like giving me the, the Z's emoji like I want to go to sleep. Oh, great. A third rounder is going to be on special teams. Yes, because the roster is really good. Yeah, it's hard to get on the field. Yeah, even as a third round draft choice on this roster because the roster is that good. So don't dismiss Dorian Williams because he's going to start his career here on special teams. That's what Terrell Bernard had to do. Why? Because he had two Pro Bowl starting linebackers on yeah. defense last yeah. year. So it's different. And now, at least as it sits, Maddie, the middle linebacker position competition is A.J. Klein, Terrell Bernard, and Balin Spector. It's those three guys because an off-the-ball middle linebacker was not available after Drew Sanders went off the board earlier in the round. I think he went pick 63, I want to say, somewhere around there. Um... Yeah, I mean, he was off the board already, so he was not an option for them uh, come the third round. They could have taken him at the bottom of the second round if they wanted, but Osiris Torrance, as you heard Brandon Bean say, was sticking out on the board. He was the only guy there. Yeah, he said Osiris Torrance was was sticking out a lot among other players. And, and going back to Dorian Williams and what Brandon Bean said about him, Bean said, you know, we see him coming in and – the least he can do is earn a jersey. The least he can do is make this team. And then there's the special teams contributions that we think that, that he'll be able to offer to this team. And we think special teams coordinator Matthew Smiley is going to be really excited to have a guy like that on special teams. He said he's going to start at outside linebacker, but the rest of his career, first year looking at Will Linebacker, but the rest of his career, they're not going to put a label on where he could play within the defense. Right. I, I think the reason it makes sense to start in there is he's only 228 pounds that's number one number two he's got a very long lean frame so it's not like he's this girthy broad-shouldered guy that's going to be able to take on a 230 pound linebacker like Lamondre or running back yes. like Lamondre Stevenson and stick him in the hole and drop him mm -hmm. that's just not going to happen he's not filled out in terms of his frame he's lean and angular to begin with I think the attractive thing about him is even though he's only six foot one, he's got 10 and a quarter inch hands. He's got almost 34 inch arms. So he gets to players because of his speed and his length. So those are attractive qualities for him. Um, there are inconsistencies to his game. He's a read and react player. He's not really anticipating scheme and diagnosing plays lightning fast. That's not what he does. He's an athlete. And he makes plays because he's an exceptional athlete. So you can always add athletes to your defense, especially in a division that keeps adding more speed, it seems. Devon A-Chain goes to the Miami Dolphins. The guy runs a 4-3-2. He's a pocket rocket at 5'8", 188. But does that team really need to get faster? No. <laughs> so get some athletes on defense that can catch him and tackle And adding athletes to your roster, I mean, we live in a world of, of where positionless football gets thrown out a bunch, and maybe this is a player that fits in that word in different packages that the Bills have on defense. Again, Sean McDermott's going to be calling the plays uh, for the Bills the first in his first first season as a play caller again uh, we know he did that with different teams but hasn't done that yet for the Buffalo Bills so who knows 
in the next few years, if Sean McDermott continues to do so, what they could see for a player like Dorian Williams, where they could use him all within the defense. This is a 4 2 5 defense, but they have a lot of different packages where somebody like him could be used. Speaking of Dorian Williams, we've got him in the Zoom room talking with Bill's media for the first time. So here he is. So uh, just tell us what it was like, you know, when you got that phone call from the Bills. Oh, man, you know, hearts racing. You know, you've been waiting a long time for that call, man. It felt like you're waiting forever. Um, you know, it's, it's an amazing feeling, you know, to see, you know, Buffalo Bills pop up on there, you know, amazing fan base. You know, it's an amazing feeling, man. So, yeah, it's just um, we know you. there's something you've been waiting for you all, all your entire life. So what is something that you, you know, you add to this Bills roster? Um, I feel like I'm a high character guy. You know, I, I feel like uh, my play on the field, I feel like the film speaks for itself, you know, going sideline to sideline, um, you know, making plays and coverage, getting guys on the ground, getting the ball back for, you know, our offense. And that's what it's, it's all about. So, I mean, you bring that winning mentality. I mean, you know, you come in when Tulane was two and 10 to 12 and two. You know yes, what I mean? Sir. So, you know, just run us by, or just just take us through that perseverance on how you was able to, you know, transition that team to a winner. Um, you know, it was tough, you know, going through the two and 10 season, you know, having to relocate from the hurricane and everything, you know, we went through. But, um, I mean, we stuck together as a team. I felt like that going through all that adversity made us, you know, an even better team. And, you know, uh, you know, we just built a brotherhood through the summer. You know, we held each other accountable. Uh, we loved up on each other and, you know, we, we made each other better every day. And, you know, uh, I feel like everybody plays better, you know, when you're playing for more than yourself. No doubt, my guy. Congrats. Welcome to sure, Buffalo. Appreciate you. Hey, Dorian. Catherine Fitzgerald with the Buffalo News. Congratulations and um, welcome to Buffalo. Hey, to thanks. follow up on what you were just saying about the adversity that you had in college, I mean, the Bills had a lot of that last season. Did that come up during any of your conversations with them? Um, no, ma'am. Nah, they didn't really, you know, talk about how they, you know, how they handled their adversity or we'll talk about, you know, how Tulane handled their adversity and, you know, how yeah. I worked on my mental, you know, to, to help pull guys along, you know, during those yeah. tough times. And, you know, I felt like that was definitely great conversations. You know, everybody handled adversity different. And, you know, that's part of, you know, being a captain on the team is knowing how other guys handle that adversity and how they, how you can help them overcome that. And then you talk some about what you bring to Buffalo. What do you like about their defense that you can fit into just to kind of bring the two of y'all together? I like how, you know, they, they always play fast and how how physical they are. You know, uh, you know, we always love to, uh, at Tulane, we love to play very physical. You know, we love to make big hits. We always get into, you know, little scuffles about how, who hits the hardest on the team and, you know, and who makes the, you know, the biggest hit during the game. So that's something y'all love about their defense. How often did you win that for biggest hit? Uh, I, I would say pretty often. I would say pretty often. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Congrats again. Appreciate you. Hey, hey Dorian, Alex Brasky with the Batavia Daily News. Going back to the prospect of playing with this defense, you have the opportunity to play alongside an all-pro and Matt Milano. Uh, what are your impressions of him from afar? What's the excitement level of having that opportunity to play alongside him? Oh, man, I, like, I love how versatile he is as a player. I love how he uses hands to go off blocks. I love how he plays sideline to sideline as well, how he, how he does in coverage as well. You know, I, I love, you know, to learn from him, you know, learn uh, the way he plays. And, you know, it's just certain things he looked for on film as well. You mentioned the fan base, and I believe your first response. What are your impressions of the fan base, Bills Mafia? Um, uh, my first experience was actually when I was in New Orleans, you know, um, I was at a, a restaurant, and uh, the Bills fans was like, oh, yeah, you play – you play football at Tulane, yeah. Like we're we're gonna draft you you uh, in a couple years, and they actually paid for my meal and everything. So I was like, oh yeah, now nah, these, these guys they're, they're they're for real. So I mean, you know, you always see it on social media, but you know, having it in real life is is an amazing feeling. All right, thanks. Good luck. Appreciate it. Hey Dorian, how are you? Sal Capaccio, WGR Radio in Buffalo. Congratulations. Welcome to Buffalo. Thank you. Thank you. I'm um I know Brandon Bean just spoke and he said you're gonna start off outside, but obviously he likes interchangeable linebackers. Where do you see yourself as your best fit at the NFL level, inside or outside? Um, I mean wherever they, you know, they put me at, you know, I'm glad to play it. Uh I like to, you know, be on the field, just be on the field, you know. I'd be able to go sideline to sideline, be able to, you know, being off the ball, I feel like you can play sideline to sideline, make tons of plays. So I mean, I, I was inside of here at Tulane, but I mean I feel like I can fit in any scheme.
And obviously, as a, a first year player, especially in the NFL at your position, you'll be asked to play a lot of special teams. Um, you know, how does that suit you? I know that uh, you did some of that as well in college. Yes, sir. Um, special teams was a big role of us at Tulane, and you know we put our we put our guys out there on special teams. So it was always a it's a big part of the game that a lot of people overlook. And uh, you know I'm happy to get out there and you know run down there and punt. You know hold, hold guys up on punt block. You know I'm ready to do whatever it takes to win. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Congratulations again. Thank you. Hey, Dorian. It's Catherine again. Um, I wanted to follow up on you said meeting those Bills fans. Was that when the team was there for Thanksgiving for that game the other year, or was this just like totally random yeah, fans? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Nah, it was actually I'm like I was I was like, oh, is they play games like, you know, downtown. It was like, nah, we're just down here, you know, enjoying life. And, you know, they're, you know, it's Bill's Mafia, man. It's, it's hard to beat them. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the questions we have tonight. Thanks, Dorian. And that is hilarious. Bill's Mafia is absolutely everywhere. And I love that somebody said, we're going to draft you and let me pay for your meal. <laughs> And they did. And they Talk did. Talk about a, a soothsayer. We got to get that person on the pre-draft crew so they can tell us who's getting picked. My seriously, gosh. seriously. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about what Brandon Bean said about Dorian Williams. Want to cover yes. Osiris Torrance? What he had to say about Torrance before we wrap up this evening, almost into the morning here, as it's nearing eleven thirty. Um, Brandon Bean said he thinks you know. Osiris Torrance is going to fit more on the interior here with the Bills and says that's where his best chance is going to be. Uh, didn't want to say what side he's going to play on, whether it's right or left, but said that he's going to come in and compete. What did yeah. you think about his comments about Osiris Torrance? I think he's going to compete at right guard. Mm -hmm. They made a financial investment in Connor McGovern in free agency. He got the largest free agent contract of the guys they brought in that were new. That, to me, says that's your starting left guard. So right guard is the position that's up for competition. So that's Ryan Bates, David Edwards, and Osiris Torrance. And may the best man win. I thought it was interesting that Brandon Bean sees a role for Ryan Bates, even if for some reason he can't hold on to the starting right guard job. Because he said, you know, if Mitch Morse gets hurt, he's probably our backup center. Mm -hmm. Somebody gets hurt at tackle and we don't have a swing tackle, like for some reason maybe David Questenberry's hurt. Bates could even finish a game for us out at tackle. Um, that's the whole reason they traded for him in his rookie year in a, in a deal with Philadelphia when they got him here, even though they traded for an undrafted free agent because of Ryan Bates' position versatility. Yeah. That's why he – I don't – is he going to start in September at right guard? I don't know. Maybe Osiris Torrance beats him out. Maybe mm -hmm. David Edwards beats him out. But what I do know is Ryan Bates is going to be on the roster because his position versatility is his job security. He's been used so much on this offensive line, and, and it's hard to go through an entire season without losing a starter on the offensive line. It just really hasn't happened for this group in the last three seasons. So he's, uh, he's somebody that's a need for this team because of the versatility that he offers. And then you add a guy like Osiris Torrance, doesn't have the versatility, but is really good at what he does and proved that when he moved from Louisiana to Florida and did it against some of the best SEC defenses in the country. Uh, so the depth that they're adding there, the protection that Josh Allen is getting, this offensive line looks a lot sturdier. It looks a lot, it looks a lot bigger in terms of the amount of players that are in that room. Uh, a lot of injuries the past couple years with this group, and hopefully that's not the case as we enter this 2023 season. Anything else stand out to you from Brandon Bean's press conference tonight? Um, no, I don't think there's anything tremendously noteworthy there in terms of, oh, that was shocking yeah. or anything like that. I think they just followed their board, went with what the board told them. It happened to be on the offensive side. I think there was a pointed effort to get a playmaker in the first round, despite what Brandon Bean said, and I'm glad there was, because Kincaid is going to help this passing game tremendously. But I think Osiris Torrance is a nice add. Uh, it was time to get some youth some more youth up front. I mean, they did that a couple of years ago with Spencer Brown and with uh, Tommy Doyle, you know, in back-to-back -back picks round three, round four a few years ago. It was time to kind of hit that well again, and I'm glad that they did. The biggest difference between Osiris Torrance and Ryan Bates, nobody moves Osiris Torrance in reverse. It's not part of his transmission. Yeah. He's Unless he's space. taking a step back and putting it into reverse himself, he's a wall. nobody moves him backwards. And then more importantly... In the run front, driving guys off the line of scrimmage. Osiris Torrance does that 
with ease. He is a massive human being, and he moves people, no matter how big they are. So I, I think that's going to help in the run front as well. So they got, they got a girthy guy that can make a difference up front, and I think he's going to be a tough out in the com- competition at yeah. right guard. I think he is. Maybe he's that missing position that the run game needed this last season. Maybe it's something they're going to get this season in Osiris Torrance. All right, tomorrow, rounds four through seven. The Bills have two picks left, but Brandon Bean did mention seeing if they could add something more possibly if it comes about. Right now they've got a fifth-round pick and a sixth-round pick. No fourth-round pick, so the Bills are going to be hanging on for a little bit. Brandon Bean said it's going to kill me that we don't have a fourth-round pick, but I did see sleep better last night knowing that we had somebody like Dalton Kincaid. So knowing they just have two picks right now, a fifth rounder and a sixth rounder, anything that's that's peeking out for you on the draft board, any idea, anything you want to say about the final day of the NFL draft? I think when you get to day three, especially when you don't have a pick in the fourth round, it's kind of a crapshoot. You're going to take whatever is best on your board. And there are occasions where, If things are relatively close, you may drift towards a positional need a little bit more rather than, like, trust your board. This is the top, top, top guy. If there's Mm -hmm. three people in range of another guy, you might drift towards position more later in the draft. And I know that corner is one of the deepest positions, so there might still be some decent value there. Um, You know, what is left at safety? Because safety's only started coming off the board towards the end of day two. So maybe there's a safety you like late. So I'm looking, I'm thinking secondary here on day three. And then if there's some wide receiver sleeper that you like. That's a good point. I think that could be an option as well. But I think we all need to prepare ourselves, Maddie, knowing that the Bills only have five total picks for one of the largest undrafted free agent rookie classes we've seen in quite some time here. It could number 12 to 15 players. It yeah, could be they, big. They've got a lot of roster spots to fill as we head into rookie minicamp and OTAs and into into mandatory minicamp and training camp soon after that. So day three begins tomorrow at noon Eastern, rounds four through seven. The Bills have a fifth rounder and a sixth rounder right now. So it'll be interesting, intriguing to see who they decide to go with. Is it defense? Is it offense? How does it look for the rest of the AFC East we're going to be breaking it all down on buffalobills.com the rest of the evening and throughout the draft tomorrow. And, of course, you can find the draft on NFL Network. They're going to have you covered wall-to-wall on day three. It starts at noon Eastern. Also, tune in to One Bills Live on Monday, 1 to 3, where Chris Brown and Steve Tasker are going to be recapping the entire Bills draft and telling you everything you need to know about the newest members of the Bills. We're signing off here after day two. Two has been wrapped up an offensive lineman and a linebacker the newest members of the bills for chris brown i'm maddie glab we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening